Hey Saints, how's it going? All right, got another video ready for you. Um, let's just get right into it, amen? Uh, Father God, I just lift this video up to you. Father God, I just thank you. And may you bless these people that are uh, watching this video, that are listening to this video. If there's anyone out there that needs to be healed, may they be healed in the name of Jesus. May this video go out to those um, May it minister to those that, that need it, Lord. Holy Spirit, come. I know you're here, but I'd like to invite you. Holy Spirit, come. Have your way. Have your way in this video. And I cover this video with the blood of Jesus Christ. I thank you, Lord, that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. And uh, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's get it. Let's get it. Okay, well, I want to talk to you, saints, about today is I want to go over rejection, rejection. So, um, of course, we want to be doers of the word, right? We don't want to just um, listen to the word and sit on our couch. We want to be doers of the word. But ultimately, there's going to be circumstances that might come up and uh, we might undergo some rejection. And so that's what I want to talk to you guys about. And... Um, uh, one of the things I'm going to talk to you about is back in uh, talking about um, Samuel, uh, Samuel again. And um, I want you guys to remember that as the priest goes, so did Israel. OK, so if the priest was good, then normally Israel did pretty good. But if the priest wasn't, then, you know, you know what happened. And throughout history, Israel uh, you know, I had this up and down, up and down in their history. And so, uh, in this particular time, uh, Israel, they were just getting beat up with the Philistines in, in battle. And this is with uh, Eli, Eli as the priest. And the Philistines were just, you know, they were having their way with them. But I want to go back into chapter 4. And Samuel, uh, Israel at his de desperation, you know, they were bringing the Ark of the Covenant up and they're like, okay, we have the Ark of the Covenant. Let's display it. Let, let, let's have it out. And the Philistines, when they saw this, yeah, at first they were like, oh, wait, this is the Ark of the Covenant that, you know, destroyed the Pharaoh in, in Egypt. And, uh, but an assuming a battle happened and guess what? The Philistines won. And, uh, you know, but this was this was also the battle that if you notice that Hopney and uh, Phineas, they died in battle, just like it was prophesied. Right. So, so they died in the battle. And um, there was a messenger that did escape this battle. He is he escaped and he went back and he told Eli what had happened. Um, and uh, when Eli was I mean, when the messengers was explaining to Eli, what had happened, and even though the uh, the Ark of the Covenant was was stolen, remember the Philistines stole the Ark of the Covenant, and when the messenger said the Ark of the Covenant, Eli fell back and he died. Okay, so he died, and so uh, yeah, speaking of powerful words, right? And so um, this was in uh, Samuel four eighteen. And so, as you can see, now there's a passing of the guard. So now Eli's dead. So now we have Samuel. Okay, we've been waiting for this moment. Now it's Samuel's time. Okay, but notice now at the death of the transgressors. Because remember, Eli, he had two sons that were just doing whatever they wanted in the temple. And obviously, God looked down upon that. And, um, but because of that, you know, that, um, Israel kept losing these these uh, these battles, right? And so, but now there's a new sheriff in town, right? There's a new priest, and that is Samuel, righteous Samuel, okay? So now we see God begins to move under this new management, so to speak, okay? So let's see what, what happens, what happens. So now, so now with Samuel, Samuel as the priest, uh, we notice that the Ark of the Covenant smites the Philistines, okay? 
So this is where the Philistines, they brought it into each of their cities and the Ark of the Covenant would just, you know, it would tear down their idols. Uh, it would give them diseases. And so they didn't want it. So they pass it on to the next Philistine city, you know, and they didn't want it. And so and this is under the, this is under Samuel. Okay. Samuel's just taking helm now. Okay. So now, um, what else happens? Um, we also see, we also see that Israel is returning to the Lord. Israel is returning to the Lord under this, this new management. And, you know, this, this happens a lot in, uh, Israel history where they'll, they'll return to the Lord. Then they'll fall away. Then they'll return to the Lord. Then they'll fall away. Right. So it's like this back and forth that happens. And so, um, Samuel 7, let's go to 1 Samuel 7, and here it is right here. Let's go to uh, verse 3 and 4. Um, and Samuel spoke to all the house of Israel, saying, If you do return to the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth from among you. And prepare your hearts to the Lord and serve him only. And he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. Okay. And then in verse four, the children of Israel put away Balaam and Ashtaroth and serve the Lord only. Okay. So now they're back on track, right? So Samuel has them back on the right track. They're listening. And so now they have returned to the Lord. So now what happens next? What happens next? So what happens next is Israel, they win their first battle against the Philistines with Samuel being the priest. Okay. And uh, as you remember, Philistines would win battle after battle. This was under Eli, the priest. And, you know, as you know, the transgressions that was being done in the temple and whatnot. And... Um, so now, now they got a righteous leader and they start winning. Amen. They start winning. And um, it's the hand of the Lord. And when the hand of the Lord is upon you, you know, when the hand of the Lord is upon you and it's against the enemies, then nothing can stop you. Amen. And uh, that's on verse 13. Verse, thir verse 13 says, so the Philistines were subdued. And they came no more onto the coast of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. Okay. Now, if you notice what else happens when you have a righteous leader, what else happens? And uh, in verse 14, it says, And the cities which the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored. Okay. Were restored. And so you could see that, you know, basically when you're doing the right thing, when you're following God, you know, things that were stolen will come back and you get the hand of the hand of the Lord upon you. Amen. And, um, and if you look like, were the men, were the men better trained under, uh, Samuel versus Eli? I would say no, they were not better trained. If anything, Israel have lost some of their most seasoned men under Eli. And so, you know, it had nothing to do with men and their training. It had everything to do with obeying God and worshiping him and him alone. That's what it had to deal with. Okay. Um, God even brought supernatural peace with the Amorites. Okay. So you'll notice peace come along your life, you know. Now, Something interesting about this, you know, something interesting about this is, so Samuel, he's having this, this little bit of success, right? Well, not little, but he's having some success. But when it came to his sons, that's where his challenge was. Uh, now Samuel being old and his two sons, he made them judges over Israel. And just like anyone else, when you make a decision and you, 
you know, vouch for this person. Hey, this person's good, right? And then you want that person to live out a good, you know, moral uh, actions. But it ended up being, you can say, so-called failure, so-called failure. So Samuel's about to go through something similar what Eli did. You know, with Eli's son, um, they would... Um, sleep with the women at the temple. Um, they would take more than what they were supposed to from the offering. And it was just, yeah. But here um, with Samuel, his sons were judges. You know, they would take uh, gains that were not, that were not, you know, it was not righteous gains. So basically people were, were, were paying them. People were paying them for their judgment. And it's just wondering, it's like, did not Samuel teach his sons, you know, about the history of Phineas and, you know, and his brother? You know, so it's like it, it repeats itself. So now the people of Israel, they're upset with the situation with Samuel's sons, right? They know what's going on. Okay. So it's just about a repeat of Eli. Like, here we go again, you know? So now they're like, give us a king. They want a king. Now, first of all, what Israel is doing, the people of Israel, is they're looking to the left, they're looking to the right. How everyone else has a king but them. But God never intended this to be. God wanted to be their king. But the people of Israel, they wanted a physical king that they can see and, you know. So that's what was going on here. And, uh, but God never intended that to be, okay? And um, so Samuel took this, he took this personal, like, you know, like I'm, I'm not enough, you know, I'm, I'm doing the best I can here, right? I'm doing the best I can, although it's not perfect. And so Samuel kind of takes this personally. And as Christians, we can be in the same boat when things don't go the way we think they're supposed to go. And we can take this, personally and we shouldn't we gotta be careful not to take it personally which is why i'm bringing up the, this story so when you look in samuel 8 7 first samuel 8 7 what does it say it says and the lord said unto samuel hearken unto the voice of the people and all that they say unto thee for they have not rejected thee but they have rejected me that i should not reign over them Okay, so did you hear that? They're not so much rejecting Samuel, okay? They are rejecting the Lord. And with us, it's the same way. It's the same thing, okay? When you are an ambassador for Jesus, boots on the ground, you're doing what the Lord has called you to do, and you get pushback from people sometime. They're not doing it against you. They're doing it against the Lord. That's what makes authority so dangerous that's what makes you dangerous is when you're acting out in authority they're not doing it against you they're not coming against you they're coming against the lord that's what makes authority so powerful amen so when someone is walking in the will of the lord you cannot get in the way okay this is another aspect of it okay when someone is, is walking and they're doing the will of the Lord, you cannot get in their way. And sometimes as Christians, we can cross the line. That's why we got to be careful about who we uh, discuss. We got to be careful about who we criticize in the body of Christ. Amen. We got to be very careful. And here's a, an example. Miriam. Remember Miriam, which is Moses' sister. Okay. You can have arguments with your brother, like brother and sister arguments. That's fine. But you do not touch or get in the way of the anointing for that person. You don't do it. Okay. In essence, when you do this, you're standing in the way of God's will. And that's very dangerous. Okay. And guess who, who, <laughs> guess who takes care of that? Okay. It's, it's going to be God. It's going to be God. That's why Miriam had leprosy, because she went a little too far, okay? She went a little too far, 
And um, if you remember the the story of Miriam and, and uh, Aaron, um, Miriam, Miriam and Aaron, they speak against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married. Now, this is another controversy is um, Moses married an Ethiopian woman. So the assumption here is that she's black. And so Miriam and Aaron were speaking against this uh, with Miriam kind of being the ringleader, okay? And they said, hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken also by us and the Lord heard it? So now here's where they go too far. It, it, it's bad enough they're speaking about Moses' wife, but here's where they went too far. And that was when they said, we hear from the Lord too. You know, it's not just him. And that's when they overstepped their bounds. Okay, so now that's when um, God had to step in. Like, God doesn't have other stuff to do, right? And so, uh, and the thing about Moses is, is he was very meek above all men which were upon the face of the earth. So meek does not mean weak. Meek means you're very powerful, okay? But it's bridled power. You have control over this power. You don't just fling it here and there and just, you know, have your way, okay? He had bridled, meek means bridled power. It's, it's like a like a strong horse, right? And you got that bridle, that bit in his mouth and it's controlled power. That's meek. And so because of this meekness, because here's the key, Moses could have got revenge, most, but he didn't. See, don't take revenge against people because when you don't take revenge, guess who has to step in? God will step in. God will fight your battles. But if you're fighting your battles, God's like, hey, okay, I'll let you handle it then. Okay, so with Moses, he didn't fight back. The Lord stepped in, okay? And the Lord speaks suddenly unto Moses and unto Aaron and unto Miriam. Come out ye three under the tabernacle of the congregation and the three came out. So basically God's like, I'm calling a meeting, <laughs> right? And verse five, and the Lord came down in the pillar of the cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron, Aaron, Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forth. And he said, hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known, known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. So right now, God has to distinguish between how we deal, how he speaks with Miriam and uh, Aaron versus how we speak with Moses, okay? Because Miriam is saying, hey, we here too. It's the same thing. No, it's not. And God is, he, he's telling them what's the difference. So he's saying, I make myself known to you guys, Miriam and Aaron, through visions and in dreams. Okay. But he says, my servant Moses is not so. So here's a distinguished, who is faithful in all mine house. So he's saying, hey, Moses is faithful in all mine house. And then the next verse says, with him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently and not in dark speeches. And the similitude of the Lord shall be whole. Wherefore then were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? God's saying, you guys should have been afraid because I speak to Moses mouth to mouth, like just straight, straightforward, very plain. Okay, and that's different how we speak to you, Miriam and Aaron, which is through visions and dreams, okay? So they should have discerned this and they shouldn't, you know, that's where the, the line was crossed, okay? So now in verse nine, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against them and he departed and the cloud departed off the tabernacle and behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. And Aaron looked upon Miriam and behold, she was leprous. Okay, so fault one, Miriam spoke against Moses' wife, okay? A Cushite or a black woman. As bad as this is, 
It was Miriam's next step where she got in the way of the will of God. Okay. So fault two was Miriam was like, don't we hear from God as well? God had to correct this and tell them, I speak to you in a vision and a dream, but Moses, I speak mouth to mouth. Wow. That, that's a big difference. Okay. So now God is telling, going back to Samuel, God's telling Samuel, hey, don't take this personally. You know, the people of Israel turned their backs on me too. Okay. On me too. And it's like he's telling Samuel, this is a tough job and you need thick skin. Okay. You need thick skin. And if anyone out there has ever had a leadership position, you realize real quick, you got to have thick skin. Okay. You got to have thick skin. And um, so here we see, you know, matter of fact, let's go to Samuel 9. Let's go to Samuel 9. Samuel 9. Because here, because, you know, Israel wanted a king. Uh, 9 and then 7. And so here, here it says, then said Saul to his servant, but behold, if we go, what shall we bring the man? If the bread is spent in our vessels and there is not a present to bring to the man of God, what have ye? So here Saul is, he's trying to track down Samuel and he wants to come before Samuel. However, Saul's like, I don't want to come empty handed. If you notice people of the, of the Bible, when they go unto servants of the Lord, when they go into the tabernacle, you know, they, they, they know to never go to the temple. You never want to go or come empty handed. You know, you want to have something there. Right. And so Saul's seeking out Samuel. And so uh, you just notice that, you know, you never want to approach a man of God empty handed. This is, you know, throughout the Bible. Right. And so with Samuel, you know, you can see Samuel, you know, so in his mind, his two sons are failing. Uh, now he's he's anointed Saul. And we know how that turns out. Right. We know Saul just he starts out pretty good, actually. And then he fades away into, you know, the wrong side. And so, you know, ultimately King Saul disobeys God and he dies in battle on his own sword along with his son. And so we can imagine how frustrated Samuel is. And, um, you know, because when you anoint people, when you vouch for people, you want them to do well. And so when it doesn't happen, we can uh, try to share that responsibility. We try to share that guilt. And that's where you need to have that maturity to cut it off and just realize, hey, you did your part. It's just like, you know, you can show people the door, but you can't make them walk through necessarily. Okay. They have to walk through. And, uh, you know, like I said, when you anoint people, you want them to go on and do great things, you know, but we have to do our job and you have to know when our job ends and their job begins. It's just like children. Okay. When they're growing up with children, you give them all the tools, uh, you give them all the wisdom that you know, you know, and then, but at some point, the kids, as they grow up, your children, they got to take these tools and they have to apply them. And then if they were to take it and apply them, then of course you want to see them just like a shooting star. You want them to just shoot out and you know, you, you be like a proud mother, a proud father. And so, uh, but this didn't happen in Samuel's case, okay? And so, you know, we can pray for our families, but we must not take on the guilt or the shame of their failures or perceived failures. Sometimes it's a matter of them out there getting their testimony, you know? Uh, you know, I had people pray for me for years and um, nothing happened. But later on it did. So sometimes they got to go out there and get their testimony. And, uh, you know, just like me, when people pray for me when I was younger, it, it looked like a failure at that time. It looked like a failure. But the thing is, I was out there getting my testimony. And what may look like a failure in the present time is just a testimony in due time. OK, 
Okay, what looks like a failure in the present time is just a testimony in due time. Okay, and the same thing goes for healing. Okay, healing especially. That's just one of the things that, you know, healing is such a precious gift. And you just love it when people get healed. And, you know, it's, it's, just, it's a remarkable thing to behold when someone gets healed. And, uh, you know, when we lay hands on people and they get healed, it's great. But they don't get healed. We have to remove ourselves from the equation. Healing can be instantaneous. Or it can happen over the course of two days, two weeks, two years. Okay? Same thing goes for when you ask people if they want prayer. They might say to you, no. And you can't take that personally. You did your job. And they are not rejecting you. They are rejecting God. And it could be you're the one to plant that seed. Okay? You got to think about that. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 6. Okay? It says, I have planted... Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So there we go. Okay, we gotta we, we gotta know this part. So you see, you could be the one that plants the seed, okay, and you're not done, but that's all that they receive for now, you know. So you just planted the seed and uh, you may not see any fruit right away. And then, but then later on, someone else can come by and they can water that seed and then they just take off, you know, and um, you just never know. I mean, in the present time, it may look like, oh, that man, this mission failed, right? But it didn't. It's just that you did not see it play out. So just because you don't see something play out in someone's life right away doesn't mean it failed. I know we were impatient. We want to see stuff now, but you know, God has a, a way of timing, doesn't he? Okay. I mean, look at the next verse here. Um, okay. I don't need that right there. Look at the next verse. Okay. First um, Corinthians three, seven. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. So this kind of reminds us of who we are, who we are, right? Who are we to consider ourselves anything but a piece of the puzzle, okay? It's about God, and we must remove our ego from the equation. I mean, and it's, you know, you're offering someone the love of God. Who wouldn't want that? But some people, they're just not there yet. They're just not there yet, but you just plant that seed. Amen. You just plant that seed. Verse eight. Now he that planteth and he that watereth. Let me move this down. Okay. He that planteth and he that watereth are one and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Okay. So, and then we have. So. I could, I could go along, I could speak to someone's life and I'll be a seed. And then someone else could come along and water and that person could just take off and be on fire. So we're going to have the same re reward. Amen. Because I, you know, I planted the seed, someone else watered. So everything we do, it is being recorded. Okay. And we will receive a word. We will receive a reward for being the doers of the word and not just hearers of the word. There are people out there, they just want to hear, 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 you know, but then they just, they don't take action. They don't take action, okay? So there is a reward for that, you know, to be hearers of the word and then doers of the word. You know, verse nine, for we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. I mean, since the beginning of time, God wants to co-labor with this. And it's not, never changed, even to this day. In the beginning, um, God told Adam, name the animals. Adam did that. Why? God was more than capable of naming the animals. But what fun is that? God wants to co-labor with this. It's a family. Okay? He wants to include us. Amen? And that still goes on today. He wants to co-labor with this. 
Okay. So according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. Thereupon, verse 11, for our for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So basically, th this verse is saying Jesus Christ and only Jesus Christ is the foundation. Okay, the foundation is Jesus Christ. It always has been and it always will be. Jesus is the only foundation we can build on. It can't be my opinion. It can't be someone else. It can't be another person's name. Um, no. Okay. Scripture makes it plain that Jesus is the foundation. Okay. So don't get discouraged. Don't get discouraged. In fact, if you get discouraged, look at it this way. If you do get to, uh, discouraged because nothing happened when you prayed for them in front of your face, then look at it this way. Then would you have taken credit if something did happen? Look at it that way. So if we're not willing to take credit when something does happen, we shouldn't take credit when something doesn't happen. Does that make sense? Okay. So we got to remove ourselves from the equation and we, we do our part. We pray, intercede, and whether something happens or not, we did our part. Okay. So if you're willing to take the blame, then you might be willing to take the credit as well. Think about it. We are just a piece of the puzzle. So don't look at it as rejection, okay, or failure, but look at it as, hey, you just planted a seed. Amen? You just planted a seed. I mean, look at my situation again. Someone planted seeds in me, but nothing happened, right? For years, nothing happened. It's just plant, 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 <laughs> right? Then Anna Marie comes along, right? Anna Marie came along and she waters and then boom, the conditions were right for me to bloom. Amen. Glory to God. Right. But to the people that planted seeds in me years ago, it looks like, oh, it looks like nothing's happening. But now look, okay. All these people that planted seeds in me, they didn't necessarily see the fruit for years. But those that planted those seeds in me will get a reward along with Anna Marie, okay? Because one planted, one watered. So what I'm trying to say, saints, is don't give up praying for your sons, your daughters, your husbands, your wives. You just might be the seed and another will come along and they will water, amen? So don't lose hope. Don't lose hope, okay? You got to look at the, the whole situation. And this helps you look at the whole situation, actually. Okay? Because once you look at the whole situation, then you understand, oh, okay. Right? So look at the whole situation. Um, don't lose hope, but gain understanding. And it's, it's through understanding we don't lose hope. But here's the thing, if you don't know that you're just planting seeds, you might get frustrated at the time. Like, Lord, I'm talking to this person, but nothing's happening. That's because you're planting seeds right now. You're just, you're planting seeds. And you might get frustrated and quit because, why? You don't have understanding. But hopefully now you do, okay? Okay. So let me pray for you right now. Father God, I just pray for wisdom and understanding to those that are watching this video, that they continue to plant seeds, that they continue to water, and that they continue to trust in the Lord to do the increase. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Okay? So you got seeds, you got water, and, you know, I get it. We want it to happen right away. But it's going to be his timing, his timing. And the other thing is trust is big, right? Trust is big. 
I mean, how many times have people let you down? How many times have people let you down? A lot, right? So sometimes we can take our earthly experiences and put it on, on, on God, right? Like, oh, God, I don't know if you can handle this, you know, because we're so used to being let down by friends, family, whoever. So we can sometimes be conditioned not to trust, but the Lord is not that way. You can trust him. The Lord is not that way. Amen. Trust God. Trust in him. He will do it. He will do it. Amen. Glory to God. All right, saints. I love you guys. I uh, I hope you guys appreciate this message. And I hope you guys don't lose hope when you don't see nothing right away. You got to realize, hey, I, I planted the seed. I did my job. And you trust in the Lord that he will finish it. Amen. I love you guys. See you next time. Bye.